Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, what's been a continuing uh, part of our series on real-time updates on the state of the energy finance market. My name is Manny Grillo. I'm a partner here at Baker Botts. Um, I'm based in New York, but uh, pleased to be in Houston today because the weather's much better than it was in New York when we left. Um, and to be joined uh, by my colleagues, uh, Rachel Lichman, Travis Wolford, and our dear friend from Jeffrey's, Rich Morgan. I'll have everyone introduce themselves in a moment. But um, our presentation today is called, Has the Nightmare Ended? Um, and you'll sort of get a very quick sense, I think, once we start about uh, why it is that uh, we called it that. I will note that uh, you're able to get CLE credit if you are a practicing attorney, and um, I'm also told I'm not allowed to give you the information of that till the very end to make sure you don't leave. So with that, um, I'll spend very little on today's presenter slide, but ask everyone to introduce themselves, starting with Rachel, who's sitting opposite me for this morning. Thanks, Manny. Uh, as he said, I am Rachel Lichman. I am a partner here in our Houston office in our finance practice. My practice is representing borrower, issuer, lender, and underwriter in connection with debt financing, secured, unsecured, corporate facilities, acquisition financing, uh, and the like. And my name is Travis Wofford. I'm in the corporate department. My practice focuses on mergers and acquisitions and corporate securities offerings. Uh, thanks, Manny. I'm Richard Morgner. I'm a managing director and one of the two co-heads of Jeffrey's Restructuring and Recapitalization Practice. I'm based in New York, but have gotten quite familiar with the greater Houston area uh, over the last couple of years. <laughs> and uh, between the Four Seasons and J.W. Marriott, we spent <laughs> a lot of time there, like uh, most of our colleagues from New York the last couple of years. Which leads into why we called it, you know, Has the Nightmare Ended? And um, Actually, I forgot to sort of go over questions. Um, obviously, we love to hear from you during the course of the presentation, uh, given that we're doing this in a webinar format. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please email them to our colleague, Marissa McDonald, who's here in the room with us. Um, we're going to move the slide forward, so um, it's going to take you a second to, uh, to write down her name. Uh, an email address as far as that goes. And again, I mentioned the point about CLE credit a little bit earlier, and we can get you a form if you don't have it, uh, again, through our colleague Marissa as far as that goes. But um, with the preliminaries taken care of, let's kind of jump right in. Um, we called it Has the Nightmare Ended. Rich, what was the nightmare that, uh, that we're referring to? I think the nightmare that you're referring to isn't a children's book or any, anything other than the unprecedented pace of bankruptcy filings and insolvency proceedings that E&P companies went through over the course of 2016. I guess the early innings of the nightmare, if such an analogy holds any water whatsoever, was kind of the up-tiered exchanges which occurred in, in 2015 where E&P issuers were looking to extend runway and in actuality what had transpired was that large pools of unsecured debt were turned into smaller pools of unsecured debt as the collateral base didn't justify the liens that were granted. That transpired after oil uh, dropped to $27 a barrel in early 2016 to a breakneck pace of bankruptcy filings across the energy sector. Just to give everyone a little perspective as to the depths of the, of the nightmare, um, there was one week in May of 2016 where seven fairly substantial EMP companies filed for bankruptcy protection, Chaparral, Lynn, Brightburn, Penn, Virginia, with aggregate liabilities across those companies of close to $20 billion. To give a little bit of perspective, uh, the entire bankruptcy filing in 2017 across industries is around $50 billion uh, year to date. So this was somewhat unprecedented just looking at the collapse of a, a number of, of balance sheets across the sector. And, you know, when we sit here today, you know, a, a year makes a, a tremendous amount of difference, uh, Manny, as uh, to the overall climate for capital markets, M&A, uh, and, and even restructuring. R Rachel, you know, <laughs> Rich makes the point that with respect to, um, you know, these uh, up-tier exchanges that were done, that they were supposed to be a runway for liquidity. In fact, they turned out to be gangplanks, really, sort of over the edge of the ship, weren't they? They really were. You know, I think that 
every single one of them, when they were issued, traded down almost immediately. And I think really they ultimately just complicated the restructuring process. It, it, I think it was a, a disappointment to the to the folks who were involved in those. And so I'm really not seeing conversations about doing anything like that right now for the, for the folks who are still looking at their runway. Okay. And, and Travis, one of the things that we say sort of on the first slide is sort of $50 oil changes the tone of the conversation, but only for some. How are we thinking about that? I, I think that one of the things that we've been talking about is this story of haves and have-nots. And so there's a concept that if you're in the right play or you're in the right uh, portion of the industry, you have access to capital uh, that if you look outside of the energy space, particularly in the capital markets, uh, there is a strong search for yield right now and a lot of supply. You just have to be on the right side of uh, that desire to actually get access to it. And, and are there more people on the right side or the wrong side? Uh, I, I'd say it, it's a mixed bag, but probably it's, it's harder to get into there. We'll, we'll talk a little bit later about the aggregate numbers, but I, I think that those are usually large issuances uh, for the larger uh, public players, uh, particularly in the midstream side, as opposed to uh, smaller E&P companies. Got it. And, and again, just sort of at a high level, we'll dig a little bit more deeply into this in a, in a couple of minutes, but Rachel, companies are focused on extending maturities and reducing leverage at this point. How's that playing itself out? You know, what I'm seeing is exactly that. Not a whole lot of just new debt or even acquisition type financings, but really the refinancings to push maturities out, particularly if, if folks haven't dealt with their 2019 maturities, that's, that's a high priority, and even the early 2020s. And, and, you know, in this space, what I'm seeing is that when we go to have those conversations, we really are talking about what credit enhancements are going to need to be included. Is it going all the way for the folks who aren't already secured to collateral? Is it additional guarantees? Is it tighter covenants, tightening of baskets? But that's, that's all part of the mix of the conversation. You know, no, I completely agree. I think the other thing that you hit on, which uh, makes a lot of sense, is looking at refinancing and reducing leverage, part of that interplay is obviously non-core asset sales. And I think a lot of companies who, whether they restructured or did not restructure, are looking at across the portfolio and trying to optimize that portfolio. And assets that are, are deemed to be non-core, they've been looking to dispose of over the course of the year. Right, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but, but are they all really non-core assets or are people sort of being forced to you know, characterize certain assets as non-core in order to deal with some of the leverage, even the overhang post restructuring and the like. Uh, I think about that? non-core is always a polite way of naming something that one chooses to sell. <laughs> uh, but one, one also, I, I think you're right, Manny, but I, I think it gets deeper to that. It's a, when you do have, you know, we're not in a period, uh, I think you would agree, of unlimited supply of capital into the energy space. And you have to figure out where you will get the highest returns where well economics work the best for you and where that fits into your overall corporate strategy. So non-core, I think, in today's kind of current moniker is it's more expansive than they have been in times past. And so while we are not um, ourselves all, you know, market experts in terms of sort of where uh, commodity prices will be, there are certain sort of basics that I think are out there, Travis, aren't there? Yeah, I, I think the EIA's most recent uh, production forecast says that 2018 is going to be a record year going back to 1970. Um, I, I myself am... A record year in terms of what? Uh, in terms of production in okay. the U.S. Um, and, and while I, I'm hopeful that that's going to be the case, if you look at what we've included here about the reduced CapEx budgets that have been announced this year from a lot of the larger players, um, the expectations of actually hitting that production, um, I, I think, might be tempered as additional economic data comes out over the year. And is that even though, you know, there are sort of technological improvements and things like that that are in the marketplace too, it, it, but you're still talking net of that, there's still going to be reductions. I, at least that's what we've read. It, exactly. When you read different economists, different people have different thoughts, and that, that's why, you know, the, the price of oil isn't always just a constant steady flow following somebody's econometric mark, uh, 
uh, model. But I, I, I do think that um, depending on what kinds of uh, shocks there might be in the market over the next coming year, different things uh, macroeconomically in the U.S. that are happening that we're all reading about. N none of these are kind of surprises to us. Um, pr production may hit the EIA forecast, but may not get there. Right. And, and Rich, I, I also have read that rig counts are up this year, and so people are, you know, I, I guess somewhat more optimistic that if, if 50 is the baseline, that there's still, at least in certain markets, the opportunity to make money. Isn't that fair? No, I mean, listen, even at $50 oil, there are certain basins in this country which are extremely profitable. And I think, Matt, you brought up rig count. I, I believe that it is really difficult to kind of compare rig count today and even to recount five years ago. Why is that? Because of the technolog technological innovations, you can do a lot more with one rig than you could have even three years ago. When you look at new drilling techniques uh, and you look at, you know, recompletions, refrackings, and I think that we'll, we'll start creating all of us new slides. It really doesn't look at recount first where it was five years ago or four years ago, but rather, you know, you know what, what is really going on on a basin-by-basin uh, basis. Uh, and yes, rig count is up, but depend if you're in still a high cost basin, there's not like there's new rigs being deployed to, to restart drilling activity. And there's certain basins in North America that remain uneconomic. Okay, and so, so you really have a difference depending on where you are then. Is that essentially the point? No, absolutely. Okay. And, and that sort of leads to the, <laughs> right into the next slide, which is sort of segmenting the market. And Rich, you're talking about sort of where, you know, your colleagues, um, in the oil and gas space has spent their time in the first half of the year. You want to just sort of tell everyone well, what Well, I mean, M&A activity at Jefferies and across Wall Street was heavily focused on the Permian Basin to start the year. Uh, the stuff that wasn't locked down was literally being sold. And, uh, you know, my colleagues were working, you know, morning, noon, and night, and and, and, and twice on Sunday to, to affect a, a, a tremendous amount of M&A volumes and activity in the first part of the year. I think where we sit today, um, you know, for the haves, as uh, the partners of Baker Botts have articulated, you know, have access to the debt markets. But we take a step back, and these are not screaming markets in energy capital markets. They're not screaming markets for, for those who are not uh, truly in, in the have category. I think you've got to compare and contra contrast that to a, an overall market environment that's just pretty much as good as it gets, you know, in my 26, 27 years uh, of doing this. <laughs> and, Rachel, is that also reflected in the financing that you've seen, too, I mean, in, in terms of levels of activity and things like that? I, th I think that it is. I think, look, I think outside of the energy sector, things are, are, are going quite well in, in the finance markets, high yield, leverage loans. I think they are busy. I think, I think they are seeing some borrower favorable provisions and exceptions, particularly in terms of other debt and currencies. But I think in this sector, as Travis said, it, it remains very much a mixed bag, and I don't see that same level of activity. I, I, it goes back to the, the managing the maturities and, and what credit enhancements you're going to have to give. I don't see the same loosening. I don't see the same gangbuster kind of activity. And midstream, U.S. versus international, how does this all kind of play together? Well, I mean, when you're looking at what part of the industry people are playing in, obviously the E&Ps are much more sensitive to the commodity prices. On the midstream side, that's not as much of a focus. They're a volume business, right? As, as Rich mentioned, they're, they're toll collectors. Um, and, and so I think part of the play there is, looking at are they going to have the volume that they need um, and are they going, are all of these players, um, U.S. versus international, um, E&P to gatherers, to your servicers, uh, to your uh, true midstream pipelines, where is it that they're actually going to be able to hit the markets and show them we're living within our cash flows um, and we have kind of a growth story beyond just that. And, and internationally, I, I think it, it's our sense that it's a little bit of a mess out there, right? right? You've got, you know, the Venezuelan nightmare happening on you know, one hand. You've got sort of OPEC all over the place on the other. And then you've got, 
you know, the other producers, whether it's, you know, in Eastern Europe and otherwise, and nobody seems to be following the same set of rules. So the dynamics, Rich, strike me as such that it's really sort of hard to predict where this is all going to play. Last piece of it is that you've got, you know, those that have kind of gone through a restructuring already that people are calling zombie producers and things like that. How does well, it all fit together? Well, I, I think, I, you know, if I knew where the price of the commodity price deck was going to be, I wouldn't be joining you uh, here today. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'd be, uh, <laughs> be counting dollars uh, rather somewhere be here, off, though. <laughs> but I, I'd much rather be here. The, the coffee is fantastic. <laughs> the, the key element, though, I think, to what you, you made two really good points, Manny. First is there are some companies who have kicked the can down the, uh, the, the you know, the, the road and have balance sheets that were built on $100 oil. And notwithstanding the, the phonetic pace of filings last year, ultimately, whether you're in a higher cost basin or whether you just had a balance sheet that you decided was worth rolling the dice to see if we'd have uh, commodity price improvements of the magnitude it would take to, to really justify that balance sheet, we obviously haven't seen that. We're still at $50 uh, oil. And you will see, I think, another wave of filings over the next 12 months, nothing of the scale that we've seen before, but there are companies that just still have unsustainable balance sheets. And yes, they, they, you can use them, especially given the time of year, zombie balance sheets make sense. The other element that I see kind of in play for just general deal activity over the next 12 months is if you were a credit hedge fund who bought into either a services company or an E&P company in 15, in that, you're now we're at the end of 17. Not all of those funds have 10-year, seven-year locked up capital. They're, they're subject to the whims of quarterly redemptions. And there, there is an impetus, I think, in the world of post reorg equities uh, to see consolidation, to see asset sales, to see refinancing activity. And I think that dynamic of, you know, not permanent capital sitting at the bottom of those companies will drive some deal activity for the folks on the phone and the folks in the room over, over the next couple of years. That all being said, um, as the next slide, a couple of slides show, um, there is a lot of money out there are still coming into the marketplace, isn't there, Travis? Yeah, and I think uh, there are a lot of high, high yield issuers who are gonna look at this slide and say, yeah, I think that sounds about right. And then I think there are gonna be other ones that look at that and say, You've got to be kidding me. We're doing issuances that are in line with what we were doing in 2012. Where are my bankers and why aren't they calling me? <laughs> um, it, it, it's just kind of the reality right now of uh, particularly for public companies where uh, investors and investment bankers are able to look and see where your cash flows are, uh, what your margins are right now. Um, and really, if, are you in the right space? You know, the, the Permian guys, they, they had a lot more love from the capital markets uh, at the beginning part of the year uh, compared to a lot of the other uh, areas. Rich, your friends are not showing, and your colleagues are not showing <laughs> love to people in the Bakken and the Marcellus? Is that what you're it, it, You know, what you see, though, is in the higher cost basins, so which oil sands, Marcellus, Bakken, you know, you don't have a business plan that, that justifies being able to access the capital markets, uh, overly generically speaking. So when when you when it comes down to where you can make money, uh, that will drive those cash flows will drive the availability of capital. And uh, I think as you guys have already articulated, you're in a market of haves and have nots. I mean, we've had guys we've added at Jeffries to our debt capital markets team this year with a pure focus on, on energy, uh, and then they've been very busy this year, but it's not across all markets. And as we've seen, whether it's offshore, or the services side, the interplay with maritime, there's an inability in certain of those segments to raise any capital almost whatsoever, even from alternative capital providers. So, so sort of stepping back a, a bit and trying to place this into context a little bit, when we think about the high yield markets a little bit more generally though, I mean, they're kind of on fire, aren't they? I mean, Rachel, you were making a point about sort of one of clients that you're working with needing to go to market quickly with something, you know, in the short term. It's like, yeah, I mean, I, I have a half, fortunately, <laughs> who who is looking at, at pushing a longer dated maturity out even further, and that's going to be a great deal, and it's going to be easy to execute, I think. But I've got, I've got a lot of the have-nots who really can't access that capital right now. And, Rich, you guys are printing money. I mean, we've, we just came off at Jeffries of a record quarter in leveraged finance. 
uh, you know, you've seen kind of the ceiling on LBO financings eek uh, up materially from kind of that six times level, which was kind of a bright line to, to banks making commitments, you know, north of seven times on LBO financings. You see a tremendous amount of deals being repriced, even if they were originally uh, offered six months ago. Um, so as it relates to the overall leverage lending environment outside of energy, you know, these are, you know, this, this reminds me of 2006, this reminds me of 1999. These are, you know, these are very, very strong days and, um, you know, what you'll see is driven a lot by the LBO market, you know, private equity, uh, raising record levels of funds. So there's a tremendous amount of liquidity in this marketplace. As Travis articulated a few minutes ago, um, it's looking for yield. It's looking for yield in, in some unusual places as well. Yeah, and it's interesting when you look at this slide, and this has been pointed out by a number of commentators, so I won't spend too much time on it, but the high yield index for energy, right now what they're pricing on the index is similar to what they had back in 2014 before the commodity price collapse. So seeing that kind of similarity there, and in terms of the actual aggregate number of issuances or aggregate value of issuances, that we have this year in 2017, again, compared to what they were doing in 2014, is pretty surprising. So who's getting that money? <laughs> Where's it going? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, somebody's taking it off the table, at least as far as we can tell. But um, that, that then just sort of leads into what's happening on the legal front in the, um, in the high yield market. And, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, Marble Gate and, you know, the uh, Trust and Denture Act. And, I think we call it a return to normal in certain respects, don't we? Right. I, I think at this point a lot of the dust-up that had happened because of the Marble Gate, the uh, trial-level decision, got rectified by the Second Circuit. Um, we'll see if there's anything outside of the Second Circuit that people say, and there's a little bit of talk right now about some of the dicta in the Marble Gate opinion. And, you know, are, are there other remedies outside of the Trust and Venture Act that people should be focusing on? Well, they're the same ones that we had two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. So. Right, the market, uh, one, of our, one of our partners said to me, good, it's a return to normal. And, um, you know, a, a, once the uh, Marble Gate decision came out, because that's what people's expectations were in the capital markets for and practice was for so many years before that decision. Exactly. And just, just taking through a few more of these things uh, to make sure that everybody is going to earn their CLE credit for today. <laughs> um, the, the second bullet, uh, the public companies are well aware that there are new revenue recognition standards that are uh, going to be effective uh, at the beginning of the next year. Uh, if, if you have chosen full transition versus modified transition, uh, you should be checking in with your lawyers and your accountants to make sure uh, that uh, if, if for some reason you need to file a new registration statement next year, um, uh, you may or may not need to revise or reissue some of your historical finance. And the, the point being that it's going to affect your ability to access the markets. Exactly. Right? It, it, it may cause a delay in your ability to do a registered deal and access. Right. So if you're like Rachel's clients who want to get there yesterday, <laughs> this is all stuff you've got to focus on. Right. Okay, fair enough. That's what else do we have? Uh, n n not too much worth spending much time on. Uh, Non-GAAP measures obviously are a focus by the SEC, uh, particularly for companies right now that uh, don't like the way their GAAP numbers look. They're focused on trying to... Well, nobody likes the way their GAAP numbers look because that's why Rich creates this adjusted <laughs> EBITDA category, which is a non-GAAP well, definition. Well, EBITDA itself is a non-GAAP measure. Exactly. And you, then you adjust pro, it even then further. Then, then you right? adjust it and you put the perform on top of the adjustment so that you can, you know, you have every ad back. Bankers generally tired to get paid per ad back uh, as it relates to the company's EBITDA. Um, the challenge really is what are you presenting to, to, to investors, whether they're on the public or private side. Right. Well, one last lighter comment, Rachel. What's the longest, uh, what's the craziest ad back you've seen in EBITDA over the last couple oh, of years? Oh, the craziest one? Well, I mean, look, I, I think I certainly had conversations whether or not they've ended up in deals is another thing. But, you know, adding back ca certain CapEx, I mean, I think that's the maintenance CapEx. I mean, I think that's a, I think that's something that people are looking at. But, yes, I mean, people are getting very creative with your EBITDA because you have to if you're really trying to get the optics right on the 
on the ratio, which you know kind of leads to the question of, well, why are we using it? But yeah, well, I, I, I would argue on the other side that they are presenting the true picture of their cash flows, and so they're trying to uh, make sure that the EBITDA definition is tracking that. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 true, the, the true measure. I mean, when you, when you think about from a marketing perspective, what what people have done is, and this is more sometimes in the M and A arena than it is in in kind of public financings, but the idea that you can paint the most rosy picture possible. So what I've seen, Manny, even though I wasn't direct to the question of me, is I've seen people try to do prospective cost savings. Right. So I haven't yet <laughs> achieved, achieved nothing. I've achieved zero or, less, any credit than, for it or less than zero, but I could have all these cost savings. By the way, I have not, since it's EBITDA, it's purely on the income statement. I haven't talked about how I'm going to pay for those cost savings either. Right. But I'm asking the next buyer to give me a multiple of recurring EBITDA uh, based upon a number that I've just inflated based upon cost savings, which I haven't actually paid for. And I'm trying to put that into the calculus to uh, apply a multiple against. You know, that, that, is, that is one area where we've seen people you know, trying to, you know, create full value. If you right. Know, I, I've seen it another value. way called well, synergies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I want some credit for my synergy. Well, well and, and also yeah. projected cash flows from projects that aren't up and running, which I don't think is a crazy, I don't, I don't think it's crazy. Rich is looking at me. No, no, no I was not. But, you know, I think that's something that people think about, too, when they're looking at this. No, I think, listen, people will try to be paid on the basis of a business plan. I think you raise a good point. Is that you have, if you have the rights to certain assets, that can generate returns, you know, I think it's fair to present that in the most positive light. The reality is that the new buyer or the new investor will come in and say, well, that's great that you have the rights to develop, but they will be developed under my watch and under my capital, uh, so how much can I pay the, you know, former owners or how much credit do you get for that, it, I think is, you know, purely going to be a reflection of the, the, the overall backdrop of the marketplace, and, you know, people will pay more when they're challenged to put money to work versus less, when they can, they're, they're going to be more discerning. Okay. So, <laughs> Travis, I apologize. I took everybody off with that. With no, no, no. On I, I thought the other ones are very straightforward. Uh, SEC updates, T plus two standard settlement cycle. Obviously, that can be modified. Uh, everybody going through their 10Q process right now knows that they've got to get hyperlinks uh, uh, to reflect those exhibit lists, and then there's a filing fee. So, nothing too exciting with the rest of it. Okay. Uh, there's always a filing fee increase. Right? Yeah. It's a fact of life. All right. Leverage loan market trends. Obviously, the market's changed a lot in the last year and a half, Rachel, in terms of what's getting done and what wasn't getting done. And we've gone from up-tier exchanges to sort of refinancings of senior debt that mm -hmm. have taken place over the course of the last year. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's kind of going on here. I think it's more the same story that we've really kind of been talking about. It, you know, I, I think I would call it a stabilization. I think the up-tier exchanges and, and the things that we felt in 2015, I would call feeling, feeling very disruptive for companies. And, and I think 2016, feeling very slow. 2017, I think there is a good pace. But again, I go back to it, it's the refinancing, it's you know, it's, it's what, else, what else we're going to have to give these lenders to get these deals done. I don't think that most of the deals I'm doing that are that flavor, I would call easy deals. But, you know, there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of conversations of, you know, what can we really live with? These are things we haven't had to live with. And it may not be a full-blown, you know, going to secured and locking down everything, but it's, it's tighter than it was before. Right. And, and Travis, you, we talk here about survivorship bias. What are we sort of thinking about with that? Well, look, I, I think on, on both the leverage loan side and the high yield side, the, a lot of the people that are going to market when we talk about these yields, everybody's getting, it, it's the ones that haven't gone through bankruptcy or maybe they're already on the other side. Um, one common refrain that I hear from clients that didn't go through bankruptcy is, well, they're comparing my leverage ratio to somebody that wiped out their debt. So why am I being punished for that when I, you know, am this, still paying off this, my lender? This is the classic example, right? To me, Rich, this is the American Airlines paradigm, right? If we go back a couple of years, a couple of cycles, sure. to when the airlines went through, right? Everybody went through and American Airlines held out, and what happened? 
American Airlines was the one carrier that didn't you know, kind of keep its own destiny in hand, right? They, they went into bankruptcy, sold by tremendous legacy liabilities, and they because were everyone else had been through. Everyone right? had been first, cut costs, and you know, got rid of OPEP, got rid of you know, worked through pension issues, uh, worked through elimination of debt, and then American, which was you know, very proud of not having filed for bankruptcy, their bankruptcy proceeding ended with a merger with U.S. Airways, where the Kind of the company didn't, didn't get through on its own. They they were forced to to merge to exit from bankruptcy. Right, and U.S. Air had gone through it themselves prior to that, right? Absolutely, that's a Delta, that's Delta, United, 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 right? Yeah. United Continental, right? The whole nine yards. So, so the question is, are we going to ultimately, you know, see here with the holdouts in this industry what we saw with the holdouts, for example, in the airline industry where, you know, competition is going to be such that if your competitor has filed and reduced its debt, are you going to be forced to do the same thing, even though, as Travis said, yeah, hey, I played by the rules, you know, I was working to pay down my debt, but I just can't compete. Is that what we think we're going to see? Well, you've seen just a tremendous amount of leverage being taken out of the system over the last two years. Uh, again, you know, you had over $56 billion worth of EMP filings. Companies came out with dramatically reduced uh, leverage. I, I will say this about the wave of EMP uh, filings. They were massively deleveraging. You know, um, use Penn Virginia. Penn Virginia merged with only its RBL debt. You know, over a billion dollars of bonds were converted into, in, into equity, and that frees Companies up because there's a lot more financial flexibility in which to look at doing transactions on the M&A front, whether it looks at raising new capital to, to facilitate drilling programs, and those companies who have stayed out and weathered the storm, you have to go back to some of these charts. With a lot of the leverage they put on their balance sheets in 12. 11, 13, we're at a much different price tech environment, and those balance sheets were built for literally $100 oil. Uh, hedging no longer is an asset that those companies can, can deploy. So wh where do you ultimately get to? And I, and I think that, you know, what, notwithstanding the, the, the phonetic pace of filings last year, there are some companies who, stay, who have stayed out who have continued to make their, their interest payments but I think will be a challenge to truly create equity environment uh, absent a dramatic move. And a dramatic move isn't $60 oil. It's significantly north of that uh, to justify the, the debt that remains on those companies. Yeah. So you will well, see, that ain't happening. <laughs> now, you'll see some more bankruptcy activity. Uh, you know, obviously, I think it's nothing along the lines of what happened in 2016, but there are issuers who have, have been able to continue to stay out but ultimately, whether it's a maturity wall, um, will probably be the driving force over. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think those folks have been, some of them are living on borrowed time. Right, they're just, they've been just trying to borrow more borrow time. time and borrow <laughs> more money. Well, borrow, right. borrow more time, borrow more money, more, 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 right? Uh, Rachel, let's drill down a little bit more in terms of the leverage and loan market trends and and sort of focus on sort of, you know, the stuff we're seeing sort of on a deal-to-deal -deal basis and uh, some of the trends there. So on the next slide, we talk about, you know, with commodity prices continuing where they are, it has an adverse effect on liquidity, does it not? Well, I mean, of course it does. Making less money. <laughs> <laughs> well, the statements are the over obvious that I'm really good at. <laughs> but I mean that that's right, and I think it goes to this issue of the lenders are being pickier because whose balance sheets can support this? It's not it's not 2014 when everyone was booming, and so the folks who don't have that business plan, who are who are in the higher cost areas, or we've talked the the price takers in the group. Those are those are the folks who are having trouble accessing, and it's I think tough conversations with the bankers, limited access to high yield, and even I think limited access to non-traditional sources of capital. Um, you know, more of the private equity groups. So, you know, I, I think it's it, it is a prevailing issue. Right, but if we think about some of the more specific, so you know, a year, year and a half ago, we were talking about dramatic changes in borrowing base redeterminations mm -hmm. and how that was going to constrain things. But where, the borrowing base issue, I want to say it's 
kind of gone away. You know, I, I agree. Statement. I mean, I agree. I don't hear people talking about it. Two years ago, 20, end of 2015, middle of 2015, everyone was saying, oh, the fall, the fall redeterminations are going to be the thing that, that puts these folks into bankruptcy. And I think that was true to some extent. I think lenders worked with borrowers a, a fair amount and, and tried to be conservative about that. But I think at this point, things have normalized and, and redeterminations have been made. Assets have been sold. A lot of those folks have, have gone through a restructuring and right size. And so I just don't hear a lot of chatter about the redeterminations that are happening here in August no, or I, even I, April. I, I agree. I think, though, that part of the people say, well, the redeterminations are going to put companies in. I think that a bunch of management teams saw that on the horizon, saw an unsustainable capitalization, and, you know, harken back to that one week in May when we had $20 billion with for the filings. Um, it, it was, I've got so much to deal with, let's put the company in, let's get it cleaned up, and let's go back on, potentially on offense as, as it looks to my own portfolio. So I, I completely agree that I don't see this borrowing base being a kind of sword hanging above people uh, any longer. I also believe that you know, when you look at certain segments of, of the market, going back to Travis's point earlier on, to raise capital in an environment where you just have a tremendous amount of oversupply, you know, whether it's, you know, offshore service vessels, um, you know, you look at certain elements on the services side, and you still need an asset rationalization. You have, you have under capacity, under, um, under utilization, and there's no more senior debt capacity for those companies. And actually asset values, you can get an appraisal, but is there really a liquid market for for vessels, for example. So I think when you're in the leveraged loan marketplace, vessels, aircraft, you name it, right? The question is, you know, what are they really worth? So what are they really worth and who would, who would, who would, who would actually liquidate it? Who would transact? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it reminds me, you know, of airplanes in the, the desert post 9-11. And, you know, unfortunately for some of these assets, it's not inexpensive to stack them. Uh, so so you, you have, when we're talking at the top of the capitalization, where it's very asset driven, you know, what really will be the makeup of that asset base over the next couple of years and how will lenders behave based upon their collateral being, you know, potentially now what they thought of us. Right. And then just to sort of hit on one other point, Rachel, um, you know, covenant trends, like we saw things, you know, the, uh, the I'll call it the post link cataclysmic drawdowns on facilities, which is, you know, sort of page one of the restructuring handbook that a lot of people employed, and have, I pick on one, but it happened a number of times because you're able to do it. That led to these anti-cash hoarding provisions. It's still out there, but it's not the same, is it? it? Again, it's one of these things that had a heyday, I would say, in 2016, where, you know, a lot of facilities, particularly exit facilities, but, but every time you went to go get an amendment into your bank facility, someone raised this discussion of, oh, can we add anti-cash hoarding? And a lot of folks got stuck with it. And it comes in different flavors. The, the worst is if you ever have or weekly have, you know, available cash above a threshold, you pay down your borrowings, you cash collateralize your LCs. I really view that version of it as receding uh, and, and when I'm and when I'm seeing it get added in now, it's more of a condition to borrowing that after giving effect to your borrowing and anticipated use of proceeds within a short period, you're not over the threshold, but you're not sleeping cash. And I'm actually seeing, you know, amendments, new facilities that are in discussions where, at least on the first the first round of the term sheet, uh, and and even posting to lenders, it doesn't have that concept in it at all, and it may get added as a result of lender comments, but again, in the most weak form. So I think that's a trend that really is, you know, going into the background. Right. So while that may be on the decline and, and covenants may be getting lighter, credit enhancements are up, I think, is well, what you're talking about. Well, I, I think that covenants may be getting lighter outside of this sector, but I don't think for the most part in this sector. And I think even for the haves, there's this concept in the energy sector that, that things are just, you know, I think still bumpy. And so I don't see covenant light right now. I, and I do see 
a tightening of covenants, and it may be just additional guarantors and additional restricted payments kinds of concepts, and, and focus on cash flow covenants for companies that, you know, formerly investment grade didn't have that, are having conversations with their bankers about what kind of financial covenants we, we can work with. And so I just, I think the story in this sector is, is those kinds of conversations rather than more covenant-like conversations. Sort of, sort of then taking it back up in level again to sort of the big picture on the next slide, right? We've got maturities coming up, right, because in, we spent 2016, 2017 extending maturities, and now, you know, some of this is going to start to roost at some point or another. I think it's fair to say, Rich, isn't it? No, absolutely. I mean, I think that we're seeing an uptick in activity for those companies thinking about 2019. Because when you think about 2019, that means at some point during 2018, your debt becomes current. Um, and, right. and just to sort of make this clear for everyone, the reason the debt becomes current is is because for your, from an accounting point of view, right, it, the bottom line is if you have any it, debt that comes due within a year. It's a current liability. Current so liability. it moves up on the balance sheet. It's no longer, you know, in a long-term liability because that balance is due and payable within 12 months. Uh, that also manifests itself into companies needing to deal with uh, going concern. And well, I was going to say that can then lead to a going concern qualification, right? Which, I mean, which, is, which is which accelerates the problem because that's often an event of default. You can't give your financials to your lenders with the, with a going concern in it. So you, I think you have in then the the double whammy or the you know would then become the fact that the trade. And your in your business partner sees either a large current liability, they start to get concerned. The fact that you can't get a clean audit opinion then would also mean that the trade constricts. You don't have the ability to to access that trade. You don't have terms. You become CEO cash on delivery, and all of a sudden, the company that had plenty of liquidity, its entire liquidity profile is turned upside down overnight. And so, you we're seeing today companies saying, "I don't want." my trading partners. I, I don't want regulators, if it's appropriate, to seek a large current liability on my books in 2018. So I'm starting at the tail end of 2017 to take, uh, you know, refinancing discussions. Maybe I need to enhance my balance sheet through an equity infusion to allow me to get that refinancing done. Maybe I need certain accommodations from my creditors in order to get that refinancing done. And those discussions we've definitely seen at Jeffrey's an uptick you know, over the last couple of months um, you know, down the road. All right, so all, all of this leads to, like, this parade of horribles that you just kind of went through for these companies that really weren't in trouble, but because the deadline is out there, now all of a sudden, you know, it's like a domino effect, isn't well, it? Well, you, you have a company that has adequate liquidity today, business is going just fine, but you've borrowed the money, right, and you have to pay it back. And if it comes due in 2019, the time to start dealing with it is today. So yes, it will take up management's time, will take up management attention. A lot of these companies, if the capital markets remain as strong as they are today, probably refinance their way through it. But it, if you haven't already refinanced in the current environment, I think these deals will be more structural in, in nature, will be more, you know, they could be self-help deals with the creditors, they could require additional equity. They'll have more bells and whistles on it because I think across the C-suite uh, of, uh, of issuers, people have been ahead of this curve. And if you haven't kind of, quote, unquote, grown into your balance sheet already or refinanced it out, you know, these, these transactions will be trickier over the next couple of months. Right. We, we tell everyone all the time it's never too early to start thinking about these things, right? Uh, and and, and retaining you, yes, I understand. Yeah, well, you know, this is my little pitch for whatever it's <laughs> worth. Um, Travis, the, the maturity wall, 2023. Yeah. So. Uh, there's a big one out there, right? <laughs> and, and it's not just in the energy sector, it's kind of uh, across the market. And so it's, it's not just going to be an ENP company that's scrambling to get there in order to meet its maturity wall. It, there, there will be, and over the next several years, a lot of the supply is gonna continue to get eaten up uh, as we get towards that. So people are starting to plan out their ladders now, just like Rich was saying, how are we going to, over the course of two or three years, make sure that all of our debt is uh, pushed out, or are we just going to be selling down assets and trying to monetize what we can? Right. We, we've been in an extraordinarily low interest rate environment for so long now, it feels, it, it feels kind of crazy. 
um, that we're still talking about the rates, you know, LIBOR 300 when LIBOR, you know, it, it is so low to begin with. You know, uh, I don't want to give anything away, Rich. You were talking about high yield paper issuing at less than six percent, though, in certain instances too. I mean, which is you know historically unheard of, which makes it a huge hunt for yield at this point, which has kind of led to the preferred stock issuances, right, Travis? You're seeing a lot of that activity, or I should say, not a lot, but a greater amount of that activity in the capital markets these days because people are forever on the hunt for yield. Yeah, I, I definitely think that it, it has increased. Um, and, you know, you, you really weren't seeing much of this last year, obviously. So comparing the two are kind of apples to oranges. Um, but, you know, when you start seeing pipes and private equity um, taking these uh, preferred stock investments in public companies, um, usually it's going to be for some kind of growth prospect, right? Why are you going to be doing equity as opposed to debt? You're looking at some kind of upside there. Um, but for some of these companies that may be kind of in the middle in terms of where the strength of their balance sheet is, I think that as we see more of these uh, restructuring conversations and deleveraging conversations, you know, if you, you have a preferred stock dividend that you've got to keep paying, that's just like thinking about your uh, cash interest expense. Right, well, and GAAP looks at it that way, right? Depending on exactly how the preferred equity is structured, the dividend payments, if they're mandatory dividends, you know, are reflected as debt on the balance. It's not only GAAP, it's the rating agencies as well. Okay. So it makes it even more complicated as far as that goes. Um, and then you can have this preferred stock, and it can generate, I guess, you know, the return that you're looking for as an investor. But it's not giving you exactly either what common stock gives you in terms of rights, right? Exactly. Um, and fiduciary that, duties from your directors. That's that's the ODN case at the bottom. Okay. Uh, so why don't you just sort of explain to us how this sort of manifests the difference, or sort of how that how that kind of plays out? Sure. So I, I mean, when you think about preferred stock, it's generally structured right there between your residual equity interest, your common stock. And then the other end of the spectrum, you've got your debt and then secured debt. Right. Um, preferred stock, unfortunately, for the preferred stockholders, they're not debt holders, so they don't get a lot of those benefits. And they're not common stockholders. So as the Delaware Chancery Court has been saying, the directors, when they're looking at what should they do uh, when they're making determinations on well, are we going to start selling assets in order to pay for the redemption of the preferred stock? That was the case in ODN. Um, the court will say, well, no, directors, we want you to actually start thinking about maybe efficient breach on that preferred stock, keeping the assets uh, for the benefit of the common stockholders and paying out those. Um, in, in a bankruptcy situation, your secured creditors obviously come first. Uh, and then your debt holders are going to come long before these kind of subordinated preferred stock claims. I mean, Manny, this is your... No, it's what we do, right? I mean, it's sort of like, you know, you can be uh, uh, quite out of luck um, to sort of turn a phrase if um, if you're sitting there as the preferred equity because the restructurings are all about value, Rich, right? It's the waterfall. So you have to take care of your senior secured lenders. Then you're getting into your unsecured lenders, your trade, uh, any other type of claims that give rise through contracts, and then your residual, if any, available to preferred shareholders. You know, and, and if you look over, you know, the history, there's not been a lot of distributions in bankruptcy settings to preferred uh, preferred equity holders. Um, and I think the other key point about preferred is, you know, oftentimes if there is a quote unquote breach of the preferred, what remedy does that preferred uh, security holder have? Uh, what I've seen is you can have an extra director on the board. Book you do. <laughs> yeah, and, and NASDAQ and NYSE, they, they have limitations on what kind of remedies you can get when you're in this penalty box of default. All right, so you default, you don't, you're not accelerating anything. It's not as if you're a debt holder with all those rights and privileges, and you're not sitting on the bottom with the common where you have got, you know, tons of protections as it relates to uh, the director's duties to you. Uh, you're kind of caught in no man's land uh, or purgatory. Well, it's really just an upside instrument at the end of the day. Well, it's an upside instrument, but it has limited upside, right, because it's not fully participating in the economic growth of the company unless it's a convertible or participating preferred. 
Fair enough. Okay. Uh, last couple of things we want to hit on today. The M&A cycle, continued consolidation, we've sort of touched on this a, a couple of times during the course of the presentation, but first half of the year, so largely the Permian deal is being done, Rich, that's where you guys have spent your time and energy. The second point, the consolidation aspect, does that really happen to the extent that we have all been predicting that it would? I mean, what are people generally seeing? I'm going to throw it around to everybody. I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of, well, there are companies that would like the consolidation uh, <laughs> process to be going a bit quicker. Um, and, and so this is why some companies are pursuing, you know, call it for lack of a better phrase, dual track, right? Right. Where, where they're thinking about, well, can we do a process uh, for a sale of the company or some key assets or large portions of the assets? Or alternatively, are we just going to go out to the market and see what we can get? Um, I, I, I think that uh, on, on the other end, there is a lot of um, built up supply in terms of people who bought assets back in 2014 and the like, and they haven't been able to offload those assets at a price that they might. Uh, so we still have a bid ask spread in the market. Yeah. Is that a fair exactly. statement? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think the pace of M&A has slowed over the course of the year. That's undeniable. I think Rachel made a bunch of good points earlier uh, on the call where we talked about access to capital, and that drives M&A as well. If there is access to capital that's somewhat restrained, um, it, it just doesn't feel like there's a buying spree going on today. It starts with your access to capital, and then it gets into can buyers and sellers meet over expectations of price. I, I do think there will be consolidation to come. I think consolidation makes a lot of sense. I do think that a partial driver of it, and only a partial, will be some of the former creditors who now hold uh, equity in post reorg EMP and services companies that will be looking through consolidation to drive their ultimate exit uh, from these investments that started off in the form of uh, debt back in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Okay. So, um, just because we to bring things back to uh, to where we started from in certain respects. Um, okay, slide there. We just you know we talked earlier about sort of the up tier exchanges that were done, how those didn't help. There are still some exchanges that are being done, um, debt for equity exchanges, or you know in, in the course of a pre pack uh, versus an out of court. And what we sort of did here was if you're thinking about a transaction like this. Some of the things that you have to focus on, the consents that are required, you know, what happens to holdouts, um, because obviously a transaction can't bind someone who doesn't participate in an out-of-court deal, whereas, you know, in a uh, prepackaged Chapter 11 case, you obviously can bind uh, people if you can bind the, you get the number sufficient for the class. Shareholder votes, you need them on one side, you don't need them on the other, which is not a surprise. There are obviously tax implications for all of this as well. Um, and sort of, you know, where you've got, you know, limitations on the use of NOLs and you've got COD income issues, you know, that play out in these transactions. To the extent that people are still looking at these transactions, for those who have been trying to ride it out to this point in time, you know, it becomes, um, these become important considerations. Um, Rich, anything to sort of note here in terms of, you know, Rachel and I talked about our, our experience with the sort of the up tiers that didn't do as well as people would like, the, the runways that became gangplanks, but any other sort of observations or thoughts? No, I think one observation would be to the extent that, and you, you've, you've highlighted here, you have the prepack. I think there's definitely been a trend in the restructuring world to do more and more work up front. And, that, and the reason to either go in with a prearranged or prepackaged bankruptcy is to avoid the costs of a free fall bankruptcy and the litigation that surrounds kind of having the quote unquote fight under court supervision rather than doing it in the in, in the boardroom or in the, in the lawyer's conference room. And I think one of the things that we, we try to spend an enormous amount of time and energy on is, you know, cutting the deal up front. And I think to the extent that you're able to do so and, and you're in bankruptcy for 80 days as opposed to uh, 18 months, uh, ultimately, there's greater value to distribute, and, and bankruptcy is is quite a, quite um, expensive. So if you take on one end of the spectrum, there will always be exchange offers getting done. There was, I think, a very 
uh, unique confluence of events back in 2015 where you had unbelievable amounts of senior secure debt capacity, really no governors in that. You had large bond issuance, so there was a game of who could get ahead of who and the waterfall. Just turned out that the collateral ultimately didn't serve those people who moved up in the capitalization. Um, when you look at you know uh, doing transactions involving bankruptcy, you know the more that one can can get the hard work done out of court and minimize the time that you spend in court, ultimately create more value for all your stakeholders. Fair enough. With that, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Before we take a question or two, did want to note for the attorneys that are out there uh, participating by a webinar, you must note this number on the affirmation form to earn the appropriate numbers of credits and. Travis, Rachel, and I are going to write this down for ourselves, but that number is 10258. That's 10258. So that's your CLE number. Um, do we get, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so uh, I mean, that means that everyone's hungry um, and wants to get to lunch. We thank everybody for uh, taking the time to spend with us today, um, going through some thoughts and observations about where we are in the market. Two years in, you know, we had uh, previously done these presentations and called them staring down the barrel, uh, you know, when the market was not quite as stable as it is now. We uh, expect to come back to you again in a few more months with some uh, further observations. We thank everyone for their time. We'd like to thank our guest, Rich Morgner from Jeffries, for participating with us today. Um, and to my colleagues, uh, Rachel and Travis, thank you, everyone. And uh, we look forward to uh, connecting with all of you again. Thanks. Thank you.